welcome to the Astranti Financial Training November Operational Case Study Pre-Scene Analysis. So before we start, I'm just gonna give you a bit of information about myself. My name is Peter Stiff. I am the head of SEMA Publications here at Astranti. I've been here about two years now, and during that time, I've written many mock exams for us, for other institutions, and I've also written actual exams for SEMA themselves. Also in this time, I've marked many of the mock exams that we provide here at Astranti. Uh, so I have a good knowledge of the internal workings of the exam and the common mistakes that students tend to make. And finally, those of you who've used Astranti before, perhaps used our study text, I've been the author of several of those texts. So how is this pre-scene video series going to work? Well, first of all, I'm going to go through the entire pre-scene on a section-by-section -section basis, interpreting and analyzing the information as I go along. So picking up the key points, relating it back to the, the general floriculture industry, picking up on some of the key business models that you will have used throughout your studies in E1, F1, and P1, and also how those may be used by the examiner in the actual exam, which ties in, of course, to likely exam issues, the key things that examiners are known for testing or are likely to bring up. And of course, on top of that, I'll be giving you general exam hints and tips that I've picked up from my knowledge of, of marking exams in the past and seeing the common mistakes that students tend to make and helping you overcome those. Next, we'll move on to the strategic analysis video. This will be a large video that essentially ties everything together, brings in all the different models, all the key analysis points, a very am amalgamation of everything that you will be expected to know for the exam. And finally, my top 10 issues. So this will be the top 10 questions that I think may come up in the exam. And this, of course, is based on my knowledge of the pre-scene, based on my knowledge of the common things examiners test, and also based on past papers and the kind of things that the examiners have asked in the past. So how would it work? Well, as we're going through section by section, I will assume that you have no prior knowledge. So I'll assume that you haven't read the case study yet and that we are going through it together. That way, I won't be skipping over anything as such. I won't be reading something and thinking, well, I'll talk a little bit about it uh, because they'll probably know a lot about this already. I'm going to assume that you know nothing and explain everything as fully as I can. So what I'm going to do when we go on to the video series is I'm going to ask you to read a section and make some notes so that then we can go back together and go through the, the section together and you can apply my knowledge and the notes that you've already made. So it's a kind of team effort as such. So then obviously, as I said, I'll give my review. And then, as I've already mentioned in the previous slide, we'll go through a full strategic analysis and top 10 issues. So just some notes on the pre-scene before we start the pre-scene in general, is that this is a, a context document. Now, you will be expected to know the pre-scene before you go into the exam because that is the, the field that you will be playing on when you are applying the unseen material. Now, you may not be given any new, uh, you may not be given any questions that relate to material in the pre-scene. You will be given questions that relate to the new material given to you in the exam, but you will have to apply that within the context of the pre-scene. So if there is a question, for example, that talks about investing in a new product or a new department. And the numbers sound great, you know, it's a huge return, things like that. But you know from reading the pre scene that perhaps there isn't the money available for that. You know from reading the pre scene that perhaps the non-financial factors would stop this project that they are suggesting from being a success. Now, you shouldn't write anything based on the pre-scene. You shouldn't look at the pre-scene and think, well, it's likely that this issue and this issue and this issue are going to come up, so I'll, I'll create answers 
based on that that I can just recite in the exam. The reason why you shouldn't do that is because they will expect you to bring in the unseen material given to you on the day. That is what the actual question will be about. And as I've already summarized, it is the background information to deal with the unseen. But saying that, you must use information within from within the pre-scene as it, it will provide extra information to help back up your points in the actual exam. So with that in mind, let's get on to the actual pre-scene now. Now, the first thing I'm going to ask you to do, as I mentioned, is read ahead. So I'm going to ask you to read to the end of page four. So this will be this first section here on the floricultural industry. So if you read down to the end, I'll give you about 10, 15 minutes to do that, and then we'll come back and go through it together. Okay, welcome back. I hope you've made lots of notes. So let's take a look at this section here on the floricultural industry. Now, one of the first things I'm going to mention is that students often look at the, the precinct, they open the precinct, they see the, the basic, you know, the background information of the industry and they think, oh, this is, is not relevant. They skip right ahead to the financial statements, they skip right ahead to the, the governance issues and the production issues and things like that, the, thing, the meaty things that they think are going to be relevant. But what I'm here today to tell you is that actually there is so much information on this first page that you A, maybe ask questions on and B, that you the, the knowledge will help you answer other questions later on. So first of all, let's start with the first line here. We know that it is a major global industry. Now, what that should be instantly bringing up is that it is an international, international industry. So that brings with it all manner of different factors. So transport, uh, risks with dealing in different currencies, uh, with different political systems, and with different trade and cultural issues as well. So what works in your country will not necessarily work in the country that you are trading with. For example, if you have a certain culture in your, in your, in your country where the, the general work environment is very direct and it's very almost aggressive, but then in another country that you're trading with, it's very docile and it's uh, people skate around issues and things like that, then being direct with them will cause them to not want to do business with you because they feel that you are coming off as rude or something like that. So just by looking at this first sentence saying it's a global industry should already be opening up all kinds of possibilities, uh, opportunities and risks that come along with globalization. Now it then goes on to give a proof, so to speak, of the value of the organize of the industry. Now, a hundred billion dollars annually across the world. That's a huge amount of money for what you think of as flowers. You know, people think of flowers as just a little thing that they have in a vase on their living room table. That industry is worth a hundred billion dollars. And now it goes on to talk about the the human condition the human aspect towards flowers. Now, flowers are a very powerful thing. I mean, think of the amount of holidays and special occasions and events where flowers are necessary. So you have weddings, birthdays, you know, Valentine's Day, and Christmas, all these other, all these instances where people will be expected to get flowers or receive flowers. But as it then goes on to say in the pre-scene here, that actually flowers are becoming more a daily luxury, a regular luxury, rather than just for special occasions, such as the aforementioned weddings and birthdays, etc. 
So people are wanting flowers in their their homes all the time. You know, it's an aesthetic thing. It adds colour to the room. It adds scent to the room. And so people are buying flowers constantly. Now, the issue with that is that flowers are obviously grown and flowers, just like fruit and vegetables, they grow at certain times of the year. They grow better at certain times of the year than others. This, of course, poses a problem, as in if people want you know, a nice bouquet of roses in the middle of January, where are they going to get them from? Because in certain countries and certain climates, there's no way you could grow roses in the middle of January. So consumer demands have increased towards flowers. There's more and more of a demand for flowers these days than there's ever been. And this is because of the, the global you know, economic growth. People have more money in general these days across the world than they've ever had before. And, and production of goods, of services, of everything has decreased because of the of meeting this constant consumer demand. So of course this has a, a big impact on the floricultural industry as they have to keep up with this, this growing demand. We can see from the information here that flowers are in high demand and thus we need year round production. So that is one of the big issues that companies will have to face is that they will have to be producing these flowers year round despite it not always being possible. We also know that it's very time consuming to produce flowers. Now they can't just be they can't just be created out of thin air. They need to be planted, they need to be watered, they need to be grown and nourished, and then of course they had to be prepared and shipped or flown to wherever they're going to be sold. So where are all these these flower companies and these farms that grow all the flowers? Well, it, as it says here, flor floriculture has become a main agricultural export. So this is one that means it's because flowers has become one of the biggest products that certain countries export to other places in the world. Now, as you can imagine, the countries best suited to this are warmer places. Now, this will be things, uh, countries closer to the equator. So often places in Africa and places in South America are the key countries or have the, the perfect climates for growing flowers. Now it's, it's, it extends to more than this. It extends to the, the general economic state and the general labor state within these countries, which as you can see here, greater unemployment is a highly labor intensive industry. Of course, a company like a flower growing company has to have, I will have huge fields numbering hundreds of acres or dozens of hectares and all those will be full to the brim with flowers. Now, obviously they need to be watered and they need to be planted and nourished and all these things that flowers need to grow. And of course, it's difficult to get a machine to do that because a lot of it involves the intricate clipping and picking of the certain flowers, which technology is not at um, a level where it can do that for, for in, in place of a human. So just to give you a bit more information on the kind of countries um, where flower growing is popular, um, that, that's the, the biggest exporting countries are places like Kenya, Ethiopia, Ecuador, Colombia, and Malaysia. Now, these countries have seen their global market share in the flower trade expand rapidly in the last few years. This is because the, the demand in developed countries such as Europe and the US has been increasing, but production, you know, internal production within these markets has been decreasing. 
So, of course, given this situation, it is likely that this will lead to an increase in importing them from developed nations. Although it is worth noting that 52% of the world's trade in flowers comes from the Netherlands, which of course has been historically the biggest flower producing country, one of the, the pioneers of the flower industry hundreds of years ago. But despite being the first, as we can see, there are now many. There are in fact over 145 countries that have a floriculture industry and over 300,000 hectares are being used for flower production. That's an enormous amount of land dedicated to essentially the production of flowers. Now, like a lot of things, we can see that the largest market is currently Asia and the Asia Pacific region. So this ties into what I was saying earlier about Malaysia being a, a huge producer of flowers at the moment. So this ties into what we were saying about the increase in demand. But what we haven't been told yet is how the demand within these nations is increasing. So as a developing nation develops, its tastes become more and more analogous to that of a developed nation. So at some point, a lot of these, these flowers are going to be in high demand within the countries that they are produced as well. Now this could be in a few years, it could be in a few decades, but that is a, a key factor for the future. So if we are talking about a flower producing com a company within a developing nation, at some point they are gonna have the advantage of being able to sell more product to the country that they already inhabit, which will of course cut down on transport costs and tariff costs and trade costs and all the other things that come with exporting overseas. So let's take a, a look at this section here on demand. Now, as we've already spoken, there has been a general increase in demand across, across the world with, for flowers. But what kind of countries import these flowers? Now, we know that it says developed nations, but that could be applied to quite a few places. Now, the biggest, some of the biggest importers in the world are the United States, the United Kingdom, and other countries in Western Europe. Now, think of the UK and the US, particularly the UK here. Now, how many of you who live in the UK uh, would think that the UK is the perfect climate for growing flowers? Not many of you, I think. In fact, if you looked outside the window right now, you'd probably see that it was cold, it was muggy, it was grey, probably about to rain. So the UK is not a great place for growing flowers. It also is very, has very little land mass to put aside for the growth of flowers. And also, when you're looking, when you're looking at a, a developed nation, that is perhaps more financialized, mechanized. Um, it, it, the chances are that they would not look at a patch of land and think that would be ideal for growing flowers. It'd be more. This would be ideal for building a business park. This will be ideal for building some sort of shopping mall or something that would generate a higher amount of income and higher amount of revenue for the, the area, uh, the area mass than a field of flowers. But at the same time, to tie in with that culture of consumerism, the, the UK is also uh, one of the biggest importers of flowers because they want that the average person in the UK wants flowers at regular occasions. In fact, Statistics show that the average UK person will consume, so to speak, several bouquets of flowers a year. Now, this 
leaves flower retailers and supermarkets and places like that at the mercy of foreign countries because the UK is one of the highest, uh, has the highest demand, one of the highest demands for flowers, but also doesn't produce any of its own flowers. So uh, if retailers in the UK want flowers, they have to import them. So this, le this leaves the exporting countries in the equator, around the equator in Africa, in South America, in a, in a good position because it's, it's, it's consistent markets to sell to. However, during the past few years, there has been a bit of an economic slump in the US and the UK and other parts of Western Europe. Now, one of the key things in this paragraph here is that demand is mostly in more economically driven, uh, economically developed countries with higher disposable incomes. Now, what you could say here is that demand is relative to higher disposable income, which then could, you, you could read into that as it being a luxury item and thus could be vulnerable to price elasticity. So those of you who have studied your E1, your P1 and F1 recently will know all about this. This is essentially where the, the price of a product and the demand for it are, are linked. This means that if the price were to go up, the demand would go down. Because ultimately, if people are struggling to feed their families, they're in poor economic state, they've got bills to pay, they're not going to go out and waste loads of money on flowers. It's a, it's a luxury item. It's something. It's one of the first things that people will drop, so to speak, from their weekly, monthly shop should money become tighter. So that's an important thing as well, that this, the economic state of these countries uh, directly impacts the demand for the products and therefore directly impacts the amount of business available in those countries. So let's take a look now at transportation. Now, this is a tricky issue for the floriculture industry because of course, Flowers need to be kept watered, they need to be kept cool. They have a very short shelf life, as is mentioned here. Now, how many of you have had flowers and you've gone away for the weekend and then you've come back and the flowers have died? Flowers are very vulnerable, very temperamental plants and need a lot of care. So if you're talking about shipping a bouquet of flowers or millions of bouquets of flowers so to speak from South America all the way to the UK that is a huge distance that's a huge undertaking and you may think that surely the flowers can't survive that kind of trip here flowers often they don't like being bashed either uh, so the the increase in and the development of technology within in transportation has been key to the development of the flower industry. We can see here that they require cold storage facilities, both where they are cut and during the transportation. And it says here they often use air freight. Now, air freight is arguably the best the best way of transporting flowers, if you think about it, because it's very quick, you cover large distances in short space of time. Uh, aircrafts are usually quite cold, particularly in the, the storage compartments because you're up in the air. Uh, however, can air freight keep up with the demand it's required in these developed nations? Now the problem with air freight is that planes can only hold a certain amount uh, both in weight and in pure size and it's, it requires a lot of fuel to transport uh, material via plane. Now sea freight of course is different insofar as you can produce, a, you can ship a lot more on a boat than you can in a plane. However, the flip side of this is that a boat will take a lot longer 
and as a result you know if you've only got a 12 day shelf life on your flowers and it takes 10 days to ship them from one country to the other that you are then in a rush to sell them when you get to the other side however the useful thing about boats is that you can often trade whilst it is en route as it were a lot of things you know due to the bill of lading and things like that you can actually trade flower stock so to speak whilst it is in transport and eventually who owns it at the very end is the, the person when the ship arrives the person that picks them up in fact there are actual businesses put aside that deal purely with the the trade of flowers almost like a stock market as you will so that is a possible advantage of sea freight it is also worth noting that the general floricultural industry has picked up on this and changes to the way that which flowers are transported has reflected this now transportation of flowers by sea containers is still very much in the development phase but it is increasing rapidly the amount of flowers that are shipped by sea is on the increase And it doesn't appear to be slowing down anytime soon. Now, the, as some of the things that I've already said, uh, the benefits of shipping by sea is that it's substantially less expensive than transport by air, particularly for, for big bulks. I mean, if you are transporting millions and millions of flowers at once, perhaps you would need to hire two planes rather than just one ship. So the costs, the cost savings are dramatic, but also there has been a rise in the development of flower transportation. For example, these days um, there are particular containers on container ships that have been designed purely to house plants. So an increase in the knowledge of and treatment of flowers whilst they are being shipped. Now, in fact, uh, to give you a, a, a factual illustration of this, uh, Colombia, which is one of the world's biggest transporters, uh, transported about 700 containers worth of flowers to the UK alone last year. Now, that's a, you know, that may not sound much, 700 containers, but if you think of how large those containers are, that translates into millions and millions of flowers. It's also worth noting that the Netherlands, which as we've discussed, is one of the biggest flower producers in the world, ships by container to the United States, which is one of the biggest importers in the world. So sea transport of flowers is on the rise, it's here to stay and is seen by many as the way forward. So that should be in your mind when we learn about the, the company in this precinct, when we learn about the ways in which they transport goods. So next we move on to environmental issues. Now, as it says here, and as you could have already guessed, environmental issues are in abundance with floriculture. This is because it is essentially an environmental thing. You are, you are growing flowers in, in nature. So of course, issues with the environment are gonna have a direct impact on it. And this will stem into political things, as in, uh, it's likely that major floricultural producers uh, or players in the industry will likely support government initiatives to cut down on pollution which can cause flowers to not grow as well uh, to cut down on uh, pesticides or to increase the use of pesticides so to speak so all these laws that governments will sort of watchdogs within the industry trade regulators 
are likely to be key players as such when it comes to stakeholders that have an impact upon the floricultural. So let's take a look at the more direct um, environmental issues here. Now, obviously, flowers need a lot of water. So as you can see, water is vital. A single rose being said to demand 10 litres of water. So this can cause issues, obviously, in growing countries, uh, develop, sorry, developing nations such as Africa. Now, often on the television, you will hear about charities trying to get clean drinking water to Africa because there is not enough water. So it's... It's, a, it's both an environmental issue when it comes to water and also um, a kind of social and ethical issue here that perhaps Western demand is insisting that water in Africa, the water that is available in Africa, is being used to the production of flowers so that we can have cheap flowers here in the UK rather than providing clean water to the, the citizens and the people of Africa. So I'll summarise that as a, a potential social and uh, ethical issue there that you know, should uh, countries that are so starved of water be really forced or have no other choice but to make money through watering plants when they could be using that water to sustain themselves. Now, of course, one of the, the largest uh, factors in uh, an industry uh, involving the growing of plants, of course, is the use of pesticides and fertilizers. Now, this is something that we hear about all the time in the Western world. So certain fertilizers and pesticides are banned within, within the UK, within the US, within certain developed countries. Now, obviously, they're good for the plants. They produce better pl plants. Where they go plants free of disease, free from insects, but what of the, the ethical impact on both the workers who, who uh, feed and cut the plants if they're working day in, day out with these pesticides being you know, possibly sprayed with them while they're working? You know, what are the long-term effects on human health because of this? Now, this is both uh, a risk from an ethical point of view, as in, if a company is found to be mistreating workers and they're getting ill of the pesticides, it will look bad on them. But also in the long term, for example, if they were to get ill or to die from the results of pesticides, this could be a huge um, financial issue for the company as they might have to pay out large sums of compensation to anyone who can prove that, that happened to uh, that their illness was the result of the pesticides that they received while in employment. Uh, to give you a, a real-world example of this, uh, during the 60s, 70s and 80s and everything, everyone liked to put asbestos in all the houses and schools and um, just general, any construction used a lot of asbestos. And of course, Several years later, we found out that asbestos uh, was linked to cancer. And there, are, there were many, many asbestos companies who not only went almost bankrupt when this was all found out, but then they, the subsequent lawsuits that followed it from everyone who caught cancer or from as a result of working for this company, and it bankrupted all the asbestos companies. Uh, they weren't, you know, even the ones that had moved on to different industries were completely bankrupted by all these lawsuits from, from a past life, as it were. So that is a huge risk, both from an ethical, from an ethical point of view, a uh, public opinion, a public relation point of view, which of course we know is very important, particularly for in developed nations where there is a lot of stock put in, you know, having the right opinion, so to speak, and also financial. You know, there could be 
huge financial implications as the result of lawsuits or as a result of less business due to people's reactions to the ongoing the ingoings within your company. So let's move on to the final section on this page, and this is to do with the modernization and technological developments. Now, first of all, it starts off by saying that the scope for modernization and mechanization has been good. And yes, we can, you can probably imagine this, that the machines for watering the plants and particularly for research, as it says here, more research has gone into the perfect conditions for growing plants, the, the perfect time to cut the plants, the perfect time to seed the plants, all these sort of things have led to the development of growing the perfect plant, so to speak. However, if you think about it, is this particularly an industry that can A, can it cope with such modernization and development, and B, uh, is it possible? Uh, for example, if you are picking a bouquet of flowers, they have to be cut in very specific places uh, to allow the plant to survive, but also to ensure that new plants can grow from the, uh, the stumps that have been left behind. And you know, can, can a machine really go through one by one to little, all the little plants and pick the perfect buds. We don't know at this point in time, there's been no mention of it, but it's, it could be a restriction, uh, there, there could be a, a roof that modernization and technological development can only go so far. Now, one of the issues that we have also with the use of machines is the, uh, the infrastructure within, the, the infrastructure within the nations that grow the flowers. Now we can see here that the demands for energy usage are greater. Now if you are a remote farm in the middle of Africa, in the middle of South America, are you going to have access to such large amounts of energy and machinery? Is it, is it even possible to get enough electricity, enough oil, enough diesel, etc. to where you are? So that could be a stumbling block for many of the flower producing companies. And the next point here is to do with the, the industry, the industry landscape as a whole. Now, obviously in, in lots of business, you have your producers, then you have your wholesalers and your retailers. So the people that would grow the flowers, the people that would then distribute the flowers and the people that finally sell the flowers to the consumer themselves. But however, this is changing. There are lots of different companies and different types of companies at each of these levels. And there is also more integrated models now where people have, um, people, sorry, companies have purchased producers, they have purchased retailers. I guess the, the biggest example of this would be the Dutch Flower Group. Now the Dutch Flower Group is essentially a conglomerate company that deals only in one area, whereas a conglomerate company usually would have lots of different companies in completely different industries. Now, the Dutch Flower Group owns dozens and dozens of suppliers who in turn get their flowers from local farms that are just family-owned businesses. They own dozens of wholesalers that then distribute uh, the flowers around the world or sell the flowers around the world and they also own lots of retailers who sell both to consumers but they also sell to the mass markets and this will be supermarkets they also sell to individual florists so you know, the the world the environment the flower growing environment is changing there's becoming less and less individual companies and more and more kind of larger integrated models as it is mentioned so when we learn about the about flores rosa the the company in the pre-scene we can we can apply this to the company you know the, we can assess the kind of company they are now and then when we're talking about ways in which the company can take itself forward you know we can use the context of the modernization of the industry to give recommendations on its development. 
Now, so let's finally move on to the last paragraph in this introductory section, and this is risk and uncertainties. Now, of course, we know risks to be a key P1 topic. Very often in an operational exam, you will be asked at least one sort of P1 risk-based question. It's, it's very common, and it's one that examiners like to us because it's it's easy to write about and it's it gives a good a good test to the student so let's let's think about some of the risks that a flower a flower company operating in the floriculture industry may face now of course as you said here seasonal fluctuation so this will be uh, for example the summer being a better period to grow flowers perhaps than the winter, uh, which is logical, but then if demand is supposed to be all year round, how are we going to cope with that? You know, we can't grow more in the summer and then hold those sales back and sell them in the winter because the flowers will have gone off. So how will, how would a company deal with these risks? Now, I'm not going to go into them in much depth at the moment because later in this, in this video series, we'll have a a, a risk video which will cover all the risk topics, will solely cover the, the risk topics in depth throughout the pre scene. So join me for that video, but for the moment we'll go over these in a, in a far more high level fashion. So in addition to seasonal fluctuations, uh, what else could, could happen? What else could face the uh, companies within the floriculture industry? Now, in addition to just to fluctuations in weather, you also have to think about uh, the results of unseasonal weather. So, if a company is relying on a glorious summer to produce all of its flowers, what happens if this glorious summer never comes? What if the, that there is a drought or there are floods, or just any, any kind of you know, freak weather system that you, you wouldn't usually expect, but it happens. So if, if a hurricane were to sweep across the land and destroy your fields, you know, what impact could that have on your business and how could you mitigate the effects of that? Also, as we know, as we've discussed earlier, there, the demand for flowers is based on the fact that it's quite a luxury product and in, in developed countries. And so if something were to affect this demand, it would greatly affect the price as well and could have a real detrimental effect on your business. So for example, if suddenly it was found that certain flowers um, are linked to certain allergies and as a result it is banned from certain countries or there is a big warning put on the flowers in certain countries then how could that affect your business so moving on from that then we also have the ethical implications of the floricultural industry. Now, as I've already mentioned earlier, uh, the issues with the pesticides and insecticides, uh, there's been a lot of talk in the past few years about the declining um, number of bees in the world. And this has been linked to the use of insecticides. And of course, everyone likes bees, everyone likes honey, and there is a general feel that the plight of the bee is intertwined with the plight of humans because they are so important for our ecosystem. So if a, if a company is found to be damaging the, the bee ecosystem, then that could have a, a negative reaction from the, from the public. Also, there's the ethical implication of using bees, uh, sorry, uh, ethical implication of using pesticides uh, when workers are working. Uh, the long-term effects of pesticides and insecticides on the human body have not been fully researched. And also, uh, this goes back to a point that was mentioned in the first page to do with ethics, 
is the the labor intensiveness of the the industry and the 80 hours a week that certain people are expected to work so this could be 80 hours a week out in the fields under the hot sun you know it could have a it could have an effect on the health of the individuals concerned so what we can do later in this pre analysis is look at the way in which the workers at Flora Rosa are treated and see how this intertwines with the industry standard. Are they doing it better? Are they doing it worse? And if anything, this could be used as a selling point. If, for example, workers are not being treated poorly at Flora Rosa or not having to work these huge hours, then this could be used as a uh, a, a selling point of, uh, from a public relations point of view. Um, Flora Rosa could come out and say that we treat our workers fairly, we, you know, uh, give them a fair wage for a fair day's work. We don't overwork them. We give them extra training to help them develop their careers. You know, these sorts of key things that will, will play play good in the uh, ethical conscious developing markets such as the US and the UK. Next, there could also be changes to consumer behaviour. Now, if people decide they don't want flowers anymore, or they would rather buy flowers, uh, buy just the bulbs and grow them themselves in their own garden, this could have an impact on the, on the cut flower business. On top of that, the, the the company and the and the country in which it operates could be a, a victim of their own success, so to speak, as the as the country develops and the uh, type of industries and the the level of education and knowledge that each each worker, each citizen within the country develops as it increases, perhaps there will be less uh, the, the the demand for workers in such industries may decrease as more and more people for example start going to to university start getting more professional jobs the the available workforce may decrease for such labor intensive activities now if you look at example in the united states and the united kingdom the the amount of people going to university these days has meant there is a surplus, if you will, for professional jobs and uh, actually a shortage for more manual tasks. So as you can see, we're already building quite a, a myriad of risk issues that could face the pre-seen company. And obviously I will go into these and more issues in more depth during the risk video and also talk about ways in which we can mitigate the impact of them or avoid them altogether. So that brings us to the end of this first video, the end to the first section of the pre scene analysis. And as I mentioned at the start um, about how much information there is up for grabs or up for use on this first page, uh, let's just take a quick look back. We've been through one page and we've managed to find over 45 minutes worth of material to talk about. Um, there is plenty of information here that will benefit you throughout your analysis of the pre-scene and will come in use during the actual exam. So please don't be one of those students who skips over the introductory pages thinking that there will be nothing of use there because as we have shown there is plenty of information. So that concludes my first video on the OCS pre-scene analysis. For, for more information on the video series and on the services that we at Astranti offer in general please visit www.astranti.com. There you'll be able to sign up for a free mini mock exam uh, showing you both the service that we provide and also some initial insight into how ready you are to take the exam. 
Uh, also on the website, you'll be able to purchase the, the full mock exams and also uh, textbooks and other pieces of information relating to the floricultural industry and hints and tips on the theories and the business models that you will be expected to use in the exam and how to answer case study questions. It's worth noting that many students don't actually fall down on their theory and their knowledge. Uh, many students who fail case study exams fail purely on case study techniques. So I really advise that you take a look at that uh, and I hope that you will join me for the second video.